Welcome to the Physics Classroom's video tutorial on vectors and projectiles. The topic of this video is the velocity components of a projectile. Here's the two questions we wish to answer. How can you describe the horizontal and vertical velocities of a projectile? And how can you predict the time that an angle launch projectile will be in the air? I'm Mr. H. Let's get started. In the previous video of this tutorial series, we learned about the motion characteristics of a projectile. Here's a quick review. Projectiles display two independent and simultaneous motions, the horizontal and the vertical motion. Gravity is the only force on a projectile, and as a vertical force, it changes the vertical velocity. It causes a vertical acceleration, but that vertical force has no effect upon the horizontal motion, so a projectile displays a constant horizontal velocity. This graphic summarizes these concepts. In red, you see the vertical acceleration, the changing velocity due to this free fall acceleration. And in blue, you see this constant horizontal velocity. A projectile is a simultaneous mix of these two independent motions, and it's displayed by the magenta dots. And it's the res it results in this parabolic path, characteristic of a projectile. Those same ideas spoken in words can be represented by a diagram known as a vector diagram. A vector diagram displays the location of a projectile at constant intervals of time, like every second. Those are the dots on the diagram. And connected to each dot are arrows representing the velocity vector. Since the horizontal motion is independent of the vertical motion, we can display the horizontal velocity independent of the vertical velocity. Thus, you observe two arrows on each dot. The horizontal arrow is the horizontal velocity, and if you inspect it, you'll notice its length doesn't change, indicating that the horizontal velocity remains constant during the entire trajectory of the projectile. But if you inspect the vertical arrows, you notice its length is increasing, indicating that the velocity vertically is increasing over the course of time, starting at zero at the very top and finishing with the largest velocity just before hitting the ground. It might be useful to review the describing freefall video from our kinematics chapter. What we learned in that video is that a projectile, or a freefalling object, is accelerating downwards or in the negative direction with a value of 9.8 meters per second per second. We sometimes refer to this as the acceleration caused by gravity, or simply the acceleration of gravity. What it means is that every one second of time, a projectile is changing its vertical velocity by negative 9.8 meters per second. Horizontally, there's no change in the velocity of the projectile. If we were to represent that for a projectile launched from the top of a cliff at 8 meters per second, we would have these numbers. And what you'll notice if you inspect the middle column, the horizontal velocity column, you'll notice that that velocity is staying constant over the course of time. But if you inspect the last column, the vertical velocity column, you notice the vertical velocity is changing. And for every one second of time change, there's a negative 9.8 meters per second velocity change. That's where that negative 9.8 meters per second for every one second of time change comes from. Now, just to make it a little clearer, sometimes we substitute for negative 9.8 the value negative 10. It's a sacrifice of precision, but it illuminates the idea much more. You'll see here when you inspect these numbers that we're changing the vertical velocity, the VY, by negative 10 meters per second for every one second of time change. Here is one more way to represent this relationship between the horizontal velocity, the vertical velocity, and the time. Let's suppose that we have a cannonball launched at 100 meters per second from the top of a very tall cliff. What would we observe? Well, this animation shows it. First, we would observe the characteristic parabolic pathway of the projectile. Second, if we would represent the horizontal and vertical velocity by two arrows, we would observe that that horizontal velocity vector doesn't change, but the vertical velocity vector increases in size over the course of time. And if we could put a speedometer on the cannonball, in fact two, one to measure the horizontal speed and one to measure the vertical speed, we would observe this. We would observe that over the course of time that the horizontal velocity would remain at 100 meters per second, but over the course of time the vertical velocity value would change by negative 10 meters per second per each second of travel, approximately. And this is shown in the digital readout on this animation. So far, we've discussed projectiles launched from an elevated position horizontally that fall to the ground. For a moment, we're going to discuss projectiles launched from ground level upwards, reaching the highest point and coming back down to the ground, like this one shown here. 
There's a few things we notice. The first is the same thing that we've always noticed, that the horizontal velocity is constant, but the vertical velocity is changing over time. But there's four other things that we'll notice if we inspect this diagram carefully. First is that we'll notice at the highest position, the peak, that there's no VY arrow, because at the peak there's no vertical velocity. The second thing we'll notice is that the vertical velocity is upwards while this is rising and downwards while it's falling. The third thing we'll notice is if we take any two locations where the object's at the same height, we'll notice that the length of the VY arrow is the same. That the VY arrow going up is the same as the VY arrow length going down for two objects at the same height. And the last thing we'll notice is a time thing. If you count the dot spacings going up to the peak and you compare it to the dot spacings coming down, you'll notice that there's three intervals of time, three seconds to get to the peak and three seconds to fall. In other words, the time to rise to the peak equals the time to fall from the peak. And the total time is simply twice the time to rise up to the peak. So now, let's add some numbers to this diagram, showing how the actual values of Vx and Vy change or don't change over the course of time. We'll start with this initial location of when it's just launched. We're going to say at that point, the initial horizontal velocity is 8 and the vertical velocity is 30. What would we notice if we put numbers next to each arrow? Well, first, we would notice that the 8 meters per second for the Vx value is going to stay 8 meters per second for every second of time. And for the vertical arrow, the numbers next to it should be changing by 10 meters per second for every one second of time change. So if we look and inspect those numbers next to the vertical velocity vector, what we notice is they are changing by negative 10. Now, some purists are not comfortable with this negative 10 meters per second per second for the acceleration caused by gravity. So to make them happy, we're going to substitute in the negative 9.8 meters per second per second for the acceleration of gravity. We end up with the same ideas, just slightly different numbers. Here's another way to put it for that same angled launch projectile, launched at 8 meters per second horizontally and 30 meters per second vertically. Two obvious things from the table. If you look in the middle column, the Vx values aren't changing. If you look at the last column, the Vy values are changing and changing by negative 10 meters per second for each second of time change. But there's two subtle things that I want you to look at. If you look in the last column, for the first three seconds, the Y velocity is positive, meaning the object's moving upwards. And it takes three seconds to go from 30 meters per second to zero meters per second. That's the time to rise. And it takes three more seconds for it to fall from that zero meters per second to a velocity of negative 30 meters per second. The time to rise equal the time to fall, and the total time is simply twice the time to rise to the peak. There's a second thing I want you to notice that's kind of subtle. If you look in the middle row where the time is three seconds, what you notice there is that the Vy value is zero meters per second. That's what we refer to as the peak location, the highest point on the trajectory. Since we know a projectile accelerates at negative 10 meters per second per one second of time change, we can predict the time it takes that projectile to go up and come down if we know the initial y velocity. Here's three examples. The first one's the one we've been looking at. If the y velocity is 30 meters per second and you're changing that value by negative 10 meters per second each one second, it would take three seconds to rise to the peak, three seconds to fall, and six seconds in the air. In the second example, the initial y velocity is 40 meters per second. You're changing it by negative 10 meters per second each second. So it takes four seconds to rise, four seconds to fall, and that projectile would be in the air for eight seconds. In the last example, the initial y velocity is 25 meters per second. If you're changing it by negative 10 meters per second every one second of time change, it would take you two and a half changes or two and a half seconds to reach zero. So the time up is 2.5 seconds, the time down is 2.5 seconds, and the total time in the air is five seconds. In general, if you want to find the time up, you take the original y velocity and you divide it by 10 meters per second per second. Or if you're being more precise, you divide it by 9.8 meters per second per second. And then the total time is just twice the time up. 
We just saw the importance of knowing the original y velocity in order to calculate the time in the air. If you're in a course where you do a lot of math with projectiles, then you need to know how to calculate VOY and VOX if the problem states the original velocity and the angle at which the projectile is launched. To do so, you need to understand some trigonometry, which is why I'm providing a reminder of a video that we've had on resolving vectors into components using trigonometry. The trigonometric equations for calculating the original y and the original x velocity are these. You'll notice the use of the sine and the cosine function. Let's do one example. If you have a projectile launched at 40 meters per second and an angle of 30 degrees with the horizontal, what's the VOX and the VOI? I'm going to need to use this formula. To calculate VOX, I'm going to take the 40 meters per second, the VO, and multiply by the cosine of 30 degrees. I get a value just short of 35 meters per second. That's the VOX. To calculate the VOY, I need to use the VOY formula. I'll go 40 meters per second, multiply by the sine of 30 degrees, and I get exactly 20 meters per second. I like to help you out with an action plan, a series of next steps for making the learning stick. But before I help you out, could you help us out by giving us a like or subscribing to the channel or leaving a comment or question in the comment section below. Here's how I can help you out. Links to these four resources can be found in the description section of this video. In each of these activities are a great way to put to practice some of the things that you learn. The first one is a way to sort of experiment with projectiles. It's an interactive simulation. The second one's a concept builder. Awesome practice for reviewing a concept. The third and the fourth one are more things you watch or read. A tutorial page and an animation. Either one of those would be a great way to freshen up. Whatever you do, I wish you the best of luck. I'm Mr. H, and thanks for watching.